even though most of the best programmers I know are generalists. Um, and if you become a specialist for long enough, you become a guru, and then you just turn up and they give you money, and it's great, I hear. Um, anyway, so I'm on my way to gurudom, and uh, I gave a few talks in, in London, and then talked to a few people. And uh, O'Reilly got in touch, and right now, Python is obviously amazingly hot in the area of data processing. JavaScript is amazingly hot just because it's JavaScript and the web is, isn't going, going to get any smaller anytime soon. Um, and it also just happens to have some fantastic visualization libraries, so that suggested something. And if you buy me a pint, I'll tell you how I managed to get bees on my cover, because they aren't just, you can't just request your animal. You have to give them a story. Uh, I worked with bees as a, as a research scientist for a while, so I was rather chuffed about that. Um, and the great thing about writing book is editors has asked you questions like, why? Which is always a hard one. Um, and they also ask you questions like, uh, they, they talk about pain points, which is a really good way to focus you. Uh, what, are, what are the pain points this kind of book or this area is trying to solve? And for me, I, I was in science. I did lots of GUIs in my time. <sighs> WX Python, PyQt, absolutely everything. And uh, I had, they're all lying. Beautiful. I'm very impressed by them, but I'll never show them to any of you here because it's just too much trouble. If I'd done them as uh, a web app, if I had sort of focused, if I'd, if I'd made the, the web GUI the focus initially, you would all I'd be able to press it and share it with the world. So there's inevitable pressure there, just because of the distribution. I can just press the button, everyone sees it. So there's only one web language, and it isn't Python. Um, now, what do we do to get onto the web? There's some fantastic Python initiatives. Uh, I'm really impressed by Bokeh, Plotly, Vega. Um, very clever programming gymnastics. Uh, but <laughs> there's an elephant in the living room, and it's... Uh, JavaScript, if you hadn't worked it out. I paid a license to this cartoon, so I'd like a couple of laughs. It's rather good. Um, anyway, so, yeah, I, people tend to tippy toe around that fact that we're programmers. We don't like to be told that something's going to be compiled into our language. That's a horrible thought for Pythonistas. It's also a horrible thought for people who use JavaScript, actually, because <laughs> some of us quite like it. We're, we're more impressed. So, um, so it's great compiling into JavaScript. You can do things with it, but you're going to be faced with the problem. The same problem you do is you're going to be faced with if you do compile into anything else. It's debugging. And debugging takes place on the browser, and it's much better in the browser. And if you have to work out sort of mapping files and everything else, it just gets, well, in my experience, it gets pretty horrible. I mean, CoffeeScript had a kind of an idea there, but it didn't take. Um, and the thing is, JavaScript isn't a bad language. Whatever you might have heard, it's... Um, it's rather good. Um, here's some, just a completely random polemical uh, bullet point, which I will refuse to defend if asked. I just, I just stuck it there randomly. You can talk about it or not. But I do think that the thing is, whatever happens these days, you're probably going to run up against uh, JavaScript. And yes, the standards committee will, they're working on it. They'll get there in about 100 years. Um, if you're prepared to wait that long, you'll be fine. So it turns out, actually, JavaScript, I, I interoperate. A lot of, I know a lot of people who do. The whole point of this book is that they interoperate pretty well. They're both scripting languages. They're both very simple. Uh, a simple cheat sheet, quite frankly, gets you most of the way there. Um, it really is not a difficult language. It has its quirks, which language doesn't. You learn three or four things, uh, gotchas, and then you just move on, and you start programming. And we're all programmers, so that's easy, right? It's not C++. <laughs> You don't have to, you know, you don't have to spend three years communing with a guru to understand how to do the simplest thing. It's very simple. And it has, you know, it's not all one way. I love coding in Python. I think there's a reason why there's so many great Python libraries, because Python programming experience is so pleasant and it's so lovely to read other people's code. But um, JavaScript has first-class functional methods on arrays. You can do filter map reduce, things like this. Um, there's anonymous functions being used as well, which I don't think Python has. Um, so, sometimes it's actually a more pleasant programming environment than, than Python, uh, and I never ever thought I would say that. It smokes Python to speed. Google, there's an arms race on the, in, in JavaScript right now. These are taken off a uh, famous benchmarking site, and yeah, spectral norm, mBody, we're talking, you know, 20 to 60, sometimes 100 times. Some, you know, they, they've got JavaScript running almost native in places. Uh, they're working on it. Huge forces are involved in making it a very, very, very efficient, powerful language. Um, so, the other, but the other thing is, 
you can get obsessed with syntax, it's all stupid. I mean, people who worry about it, I love Python's white space, I'll defend it because it, you spend most time reading code, so that's great. But syntax isn't the issue. I mean, for data visualization, certainly, and a lot of things I think that's been done in JavaScript, declarative functional paradigms, it's much more significant than any particular language. Um, D3, the library, uses a very particular type of, of programming convention. Um, it is a declarative and functional, and uh, it would, you would be faced with the same problems of using it in any language. Uh, you would still have to maintain these abstractions. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, we should, we should be in a good place here. They should be a perfect complement, right? I know Node is making um, forays in the, in the world of the server, but it hasn't, as I'm sure all of you are aware, it hasn't got the libraries yet. Uh, Python has. If you're doing data visualization, Python has amazing data visualization, data processing uh, stacks and uh, getting better all the time. But it hits this brick wall when it wants to express itself on the web. Um, and as I said, there are various solutions to that. My feeling, having tried and played with them uh, a lot, is that you actually want to be doing programming on a browser, and there's only one way to do that. Um, so why, 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 is there, why is there this push? Why do people, I've talked to Pythonistas, I tried to get, them to get their feel for it. I think a lot of people are scared, and I think they've got every reason to be scared, because web dev is horrible. It's associated with all sorts of cruft, uh, fanboyism, frameworks, all this rubbish, and it can, you know, I need to use an idea, I don't need to use an idea. So there's this big, space between, between uh, PyLand and JS land, and uh, I think in people's sort of uh, mindsets. And my book, if anything, is, is to suggest that that is figmentary. Um, actually, you can just pass JSON between the two of them. You create a little uh, shim that passes the data. It's all about the data. It's just follow the data. Uh, at which point, you're just doing programming. Uh, you've created a very, very small amount of conventional web dev, which uh, is getting smaller all the time. So my proposition is a little HTML skeleton. To be honest, it's not much more onerous than a lot of the tabs that we used to have to write for Qt or there was XHTML tabs I had to write for, for WX Python at one point. Um, that was more horrible than conventional HTML5, quite frankly. Um, JSON is the obvious delivery format. It's pretty good. You can do pretty much anything with it. And uh, Python, of course, handles it fantastically. Um, the great thing about Python as compared to, say, R or um, or any of the kind of matlab -y, map, um, uh, Mathematica environments, you know, you can just roll a server in Python in a few lines, and that's amazing. And you can stay in the Python ecosystem to do everything, all the processing, all the delivery. Uh, you only need to, li to leave it when you hand off your data to the, uh, to the web, at which point maintaining control of it, certainly in the visualization context, <sighs> anyway, it doesn't work for me. Um, you can call it one-page app if you like. You can think of it as just a canvas on which you're programming. You can think of it as being desktop-based. I do. Um, you can even use various various ways to make sort of desktop -y apps, which, uh, uh, and then you press a button and they're suddenly on the web, which is incredible, right? So I thought I should do an amazing visualization for this talk, and I didn't have much time, but I'm still very proud of it because I've ordered the numbers here in such a way that you can see patterns in the data. I've ordered the rows. You know, I've done a lot here to help you visually uh, understand what's going on. And, um, you know, I, because this, this, was, this was the original, right? Um, not as helpful. And uh, so, yeah, there's a data visualization. We've, we've made, we've taken the data, we've made it easy to consume. Um, of course, some people would say, that's a better way. I don't know. You know, you choose. You choose. It's entirely up to you. Um, now, I did this, throw away, 20 minutes. Mike Boster, the creator of D3, would probably have done it in 30 seconds. But the point is that when you start using D3, you start just thinking of something and almost doing it. Um, it forces you to you know, adapt your abstractions. But once you've done that, and if you're taught well, you can be, and I intend to teach you well, um, then you can do things. And I want to just show you, I thought, well, why don't I just take this? That's all the web dev involved in that. Now, obviously, it's not a particularly Impressive or profound visualiz uh, visualization, but that's the HTML file, that's the index, um, that's it, and everything else is programming. This is JavaScript. I won't go through it now, but it does, you've got to admit, it does look like programming. Um, and it is programming, and it's pretty easy to do after a while. It's not much more difficult than Python, it's as powerful, as expressive, and um, 
the point is to minimize all of that horrible craft. You don't need less, you don't need IDEs, you don't need any gulps or grunts or any of that rubbish. You can program with a bit of CSS, a bit of JavaScript, uh, a bit of uh, HTML to access the backbone, and the rest of it is just programming, which um, is uh, the point. Um, just one kind of shout out for D3. I've, you've probably, lots of you have heard of it. Uh, it's, it's not the only game in the park, but it's so much better than everything else. It sort of overwhelms data visualization in, in, uh, in the browser. And the point, I think, has to be made that perhaps the great, I remember when it was ProtoViz, I remember following it when Mike Bostock was first developing it. And uh, everyone's, why, why in JavaScript? That's insane. This is a powerful visualization tool. It's one of the best implementations of a very profound book called the Grammar Graphics, why, which is the base of ggplot2, which I know a lot of Pythonists have terrible envy problems with. Um, I do, having seen it work. Uh, but it has a solid theoretical core, and he, he did it in JavaScript. He was going against the grain then. In fact, he was using SVG, which was about to be dumped, right? I mean, it's easy to forget, but scalable vector graphics were on their way out, and now it's unthinkable that any browser wouldn't support pretty much the whole the whole caboodle. So that in itself is, is pretty amazing. Um, it's not a charting library. Uh, in fact, I think the fun thing about this is getting away from charts, getting away from conventional data expressions, the sort of thing that we've been obliged to use because we couldn't do anything else because the software didn't let us change anything. And, and as programmers, that's pretty frustrating. Um, so the idea is to build, it's, you can build chart libraries with it. There's lots of them out there. I suggest using them inst instead of rolling your own. I will teach you how to build a bar chart. It's a very good learning experience, a very good way to absorb the fundamentals. But um, there is a point where you just want to pass all that off. Uh, I think the thing is the innovative use of data. The innovative visualization of data is what D3 and libraries like it. I mean, obviously, there will be other libraries. At the moment, D3 is predominant because it's just, it's so mature. It's, you know, it's a 10, 15 year project and it, it shows. Um, so the idea of the book was harping back to that, I was I mean, making the point with that visualization transformation. All data visualization is essentially transformatory. And, uh, uh, and the point is transforming it into things that the kind of primary hominid visual cortex um, can easily absorb. So that's what you do when you communicate and with a picture. So I thought I would try and base the book around a transformation to transform Wikipedia's Nobel pr uh, page, which is fairly dry, uh, into a modern interactive visualization and to teach the whole process. And also to, to use all the amazing Python stack available uh, in a not completely contrived way. Um, so Scrapey will scrape the pages for you. Scrapey's in the, I know there's been a talk here and I've, I've seen the, the team. Uh, Scrapey seems to be coming on leaps and bounds. And uh, it's once you get, yeah, once you get into it and it's not a huge learning curve, you can do amazing things. Cleaning, Pandas is fantastic. We all know about Pandas is great. It's a great way to clean data. And the data is always dirty, always. Um, Pandas and Matplotlib uh, with Seaborn and others are a great way to explore it. And then you can roll a, a server. I use Flask. In a few lines, you can roll a RESTful API that your uh, JavaScript, web-based JavaScript, can use. That's, that's amazing. Um, you cannot get that in any other language that I'm aware of. Um, I've seen web servers in R, and the goggles do nothing. So this is the, what you, the start out point. As you see, this is how it works in Wikipedia. People have lovingly entered these names by hand. Uh, your alarm bell should be ringing at the moment. Uh, human entered data. So that's gonna be an interesting challenge. Uh, by, uh, by country, and these link out. Um, I wasn't prepared to risk Wi-Fi, but these will link out to the individual um, winners. And the idea was to scrape this page and then use this page to get the individual winners and then scrape them get all the data, the biographical data about the categories and the people, um, and turn it into something a bit more kind of digestible, I think. Um, and unfortunately, I'm limited by the resolution of this screen. I, thought, I figured that it would be huge, but uh, this is a 768, so it's almost fits. But, uh, so this is the sort of thing. You can, you, know, you, can, you can ask questions of the data. You can kind of quiz it. And the point is discovering your own stories, discovering your own narratives, and not being obliged to uh, absorb other people's because you know, generally uh, not much has happened since the static visualizations of Victorian times. You know, the Times newspaper uh, did amazing visualizations um, in, in ink and these became visualizations in pixels and now we're reaching a point where we can actually play with them, we can interact. That's a huge thing. This is an enormous development, I think, in the capacity of human beings to uh, communicate. It's really big, honestly. 
Um, right. So, first we scrape. I'm not going to go into any great detail, just give you a kind of feel for it. Um, Scrapey, as I said, it has a learning curve, but when you get used to using it, you use, as here, I'm using Chrome Explorer. Uh, the other great thing about programming JavaScript, if you don't know, is there are some very powerful debugging, very powerful exploratory tools built into modern browsers. The Chrome, Chrome kit is arguably the, well, not arguably the best, it is the best. Um, and uh, you might well be surprised at how much you can do. In fact, the debugging environment is vastly better than anything Python has. Um, you can do almost anything, and it's a performance profile, and it's all built in. Uh, in this case, I'm using it to explore the structure of the page. I get what's called the X-Path, which is the, the um, identification, the syntactical identification of the, uh, the bits I, am, I want. In this case, it's the biographical detail of the Nobel Prize winners. I want their little mini bio, and I want their picture. Um, I create what's called a spider in a scrapey, and I send that through. Uh, the, it, deals with all the asynchronous load balancing, and it deals with all the cleverness that you don't want to deal with yourself. For example, if you do manual scraping, you'll probably get banned within 20 minutes because you'll be hitting the servers too hard. And then you want to do manual throttling, and that's a bit of an art form. Of, and it's, it's the nice thing about scrape is it just does all that for you. It'll even do anonymized, um, uh, anonymized gets and various other things. Uh, then you send to a pipeline, which is your, the finishing, finishing uh, zone um, to, in this case, to consume the image. So at the end of this, I'm left with a nice array of JSON objects, uh, almost certainly dirty. Um, and the job is to identify uh, and remove the anom anomalous fields. Um, and um, clean it up <laughs> as best we can, and then use uh, pandas to explore it with map.lib. Um, so, so we've got our data, we've got a little, uh, we've got an array of JSON objects, that's what you get left with, with Pandas. And in our case, we also have little local um, links to the uh, image data and anything else that we were, might have been interested in. Um, and all that is, is sensibly hashed and, and, and uh, efficiently done. Um, and Scrapey does all that for you, and it's, it's lovely. Um, Cleaning is only so interesting, um, but you load it into the data frame, you uh, do a quick recce, are there obvious missing fields? There's an obvious missing field in place of death. Uh, you use, these are these built-in pandas um, methods. You describe your data, and immediately you can see that there are duplicates in the, uh, in the name field here. We've got frequency of two for this guy. That's flag, um, and you can see other things, 59 countries in total for nationality and other stuff. This is a very nice way of kind of summarizing what you're looking at and also you know, directing you to the attention you probably need to give it. Here's one example of how easy it is with pandas to clean stuff. Um, the date of death was recorded by a human being in, <laughs> in Wikipedia, and we have was it Johannes Diederich van der Waals, uh, van der Waals uh, field? Uh, his date of death is Diederich Kortveig, which is what happens when you get human beings to fill in data. And that's a category error in philosophy. I, I remember that much of my philosophy degree. Um, but you can see how three lines, and you can, you can find it, you can tag it, you can fix it, you can throw it away, you can do what you like. Uh, when, when you, Pandas makes this sort of thing very easy. So. Um, and at the end of it, you have, I said, the worst stains. They'll, they'll be gotchas. They'll never be gotchas because that's the nature of the beast. But you've cleaned it pretty well. We have our 858 winners. Those are the only ones that Wikipedia's recorded. It might not be all the winners. It probably won't. There'll be somebody in, uh, usually a small country, who's missed the fact that they have a Nobel Prize winner in their country and no one else is bothered. So you missed two or three. Um, that's the nature of Wikipedia. But equally, uh, that's the joy of it, I guess. Um, you then want to explore, this is much more fun, you want to explore your data with pandas. Uh, you're looking for stories to tell, you're looking for correlations. I mean, um, everything in data visualization is really narratives. Even if you've just got a dashboard, you're trying to you know, explain your, your account index to, or you're, you're trying to explain anything, you're communicating a story. That's what human beings respond to, I think. Um, so you're looking for narratives. You're looking for narratives that you can tell, and that's what you kind of, the pandas exploration will suggest those. Um, 
here's a really quite dull narrative, probably quite predictable, but uh, it's a story. Uh, the United States has a huge number of Nobel Prizes relative to many others. Uh, although, as we'll see, that's not on a per capita index. That's when it gets a bit more interesting. Um, but you can get a more interesting story with a few more lines of pandas. This is breaking the countries into regions. Um, up here, we just create North America, Europe, Asia, just take the three biggest countries. Um, and we just plot. You see how easy it is just interacting. And you can see a, the blue chart, which is America's Nobel Prize Hall, passes the staid European chart around about 1980-odd. Um, and that's a story. So America's oof, shooting off. And this is, this is all a post-war investment in American science. Huge thing after the atom bomb and Manhattan Project and the various other things. Scientists got a lot of money and a lot of support. Um, here's a huge story. Uh, two lines of pandas. Gender disparities in the Nobel Prizes. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty shocking, right? Um, you can look at individual things like um, uh, the... Distribution of the age of winners, it's quite interesting. If none of you have got a Nobel Prize yet and you're 95, it's very unlikely. Um, if you're around about 60, it's your sweet spot. So if you're expecting a, if you're expecting a, a, a letter, there's probably still letters, a letter from Sweden, then um, there you go, but it's a good time right now. Uh, this is life expectancy, this is, even, this is more interesting. They're incredibly long lived. Now, of course, if they're selecting at 60, there's, already, there's a selection pressure if they're giving prizes at 60. They've already got rid of everyone who died before. Well, not everyone who died before that. But, but what's nice is I'm using what's called a violin plot. This is Seaborn's violin plot. It gives me a kind of extension of a box plot. It gives me the distribution and, uh, in a two, and you know, very, very easy to do, a few lines. And the, uh, yeah, the distribution is just the longevity of the Nobel Prize winners is astonishing. Um, and you can do that's a bit more interesting. You can plot the longevity against the time, the, the year in which they won it, and you see this is kind of like um, doing population, uh, just a little bit of population uh, demographics um, changes over time. People are getting yeah, people are getting longer lived. So here we have a uh, line regression with confidence interval in a few lines using Seaborn's LM plot, which is very nice. Uh, Seaborn is lovely. It has extensions, statistical extensions to matplotlib. I thoroughly recommend it. Um, and here's another story which uh, is um, uh, which just dropped out. It's called the Nobel Diaspora. Uh, these black spots here, uh, this is plotting the country in which a Nobel Prize winner was born against the country in which they won their prize. So Wikipedia has that data, or some, uh, a fair amount of that data. Um, and you just do that in a little heat map in a few lines. And these black spots here um, represent the exodus of essentially Jewish scientists from, world, from, from Europe in World War I and World War II following periods of anti-Semitism. <laughs> there's a story in there. Uh, there's also a story, uh, some other, um, that's a lot of Canadians moved to America. Uh, there's probably a reason for that. I'll have to ask some Canadians. Um, but yeah, this is the Austro-Hungarian Empire breakup of, as a clear signal, and the breakup of, of uh, the Third Reich as well um, in the little heat map. So once you've done all that, you want to imagine a visualization. You just, probably less is more, almost certainly less is more. You want to create a context in which people can find their own stories. I think that's the big idea of modern data viz. I mean, obviously, sometimes you want editorializing. But I think even the strongest editorializing should allow for some alternative perspectives. Because otherwise, we're just saying, here it is. This is what you were interested in, wasn't it? Uh, so, if you create something which maybe guides people, puts them in the, in, the, in the zone, you can tell a story that you want to tell, but equally you can allow them to, to forage. Uh, and that's kind of, I guess, the idea of the visualization here. Um, before you can do it, you need to deliver your data. Um, as I mentioned, Flask is a fantastic way to do this. And this is a Flask RESTful API. That's the enormous amount of work required. Um, if you have your data in, in MongoDB, uh, I, it's not a lot longer for uh, a standard SQL implementation. Um, Flask Restless, which I ex explain in the book, is uh, just good. But this is Eve. It's a lovely new uh, NoSQL um, RESTful API uh, roller. And as you can see, it's what, five or six lines. Um, at which point, you can consume your data from a JavaScript uh, app um, straight out of the Mongo database. 
And of course, you can tailor this to your heart's content. Ave is very well built. It's very powerful. It's got lots and lots of bells and whistles. But this is the basic implementation. As you see, you test it from command line with curl, and it produces lovely JSON files, which you can then use D3 to, um, to turn to something nice. And this is the transformati transformative phase. Uh, you pass it off to the browser. I, I know you can do stuff that doesn't involve essentially passing data to the browser. You pass a pre-compiled, I guess, JavaScript-y uh, thing. Um, obviously, that has its place. But speak, I mean, but what do you do when it goes wrong? <laughs> I mean, the browser with this great debugging set, and I have this computer-generated code, and I'm sure a lot of you have nightmares about computer-generated code, because I, I can remember using Borland, uh, Delphi, and a number of other things, and billions of lines that you'll, you'll never understand, just to do the simplest thing. And that kind of, that's, I mean, that's not my shtick anymore. Uh, we're programmers. We want to control things at a low enough level, an expressive enough level, and it's hard to do that uh, within direction, is my kind of feeling, having, as I said, played with it. But that's not to say that other alternatives don't have a place. I'm just, as my perspective. Um, so you build your visualization. I'm not going to go through all of that in, in well, two weeks. Uh, I'm certainly not going to go through it in, in half an hour. But uh, D3 was... Uh, all of these are uh, completely built from scratch, and that's the other thing with D3. You don't, of course, you can use bar chart plugins, but it's, it's just a real thrill to build your first bar chart, controlling all of the different elements. You know, because I guess I'm sure you love you have that feeling. You get a piece of software that is great as long as you're doing things its way, and then you want to change something, and it's then you go on to another piece of software and just keep doing this in a cycle. Um, with D3, you just program it, you change it. So, right, so let's see, let's see, so let's see a story. A couple of stories on, to, to end on. Um, has anyone got an estimate for the number of female physics prize winners? Anyone know? Two? Who said two? All right, you're good. Do you know who the other one was? I presume everyone knows the first one. Yeah, everyone knows the first one. Who was the other one? Hmm? She had daughter? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. Not in physics. She might have won in chemistry. Hmm? Nether. Nether? No, I don't think so. No, she might have won in mass. Anyway, I think it's fair to say two female physics prize winners. You'd have thought somebody would know the second one. Um, two, by the way. I'm, I'm gonna, but I can, I, can, I can show you. First off, here's the big story. Here we go. So that's female Nobel Prize winners. Um, which, as you can see, is kind of smaller than... It's only a bit, right? I mean, come on. People complain all the time. Um, and let's do physics. Here we go. Oops. Here we go. Maria Golpert Meyer. Why doesn't anyone know her name? She, I mean, other than Marie Curie, she's the only female physics prize winner. It's astonishing, right? There you go. So there's a story told. Um, let's pull this back. Let's tell another story. Uh, per capita. Let's, let's change the winning metric a little bit. So, um, and let's do it in a big, this, this big thing here is, is the Santa Lucia, uh, Derek Walcott, poetry winner. Uh, this is an island with a population of about 50,000. So you can imagine a per capita rating is going gonna, is gonna to skew a bit. But let's, let's do physics because that's... That's, that involves money and stuff. You can't do that in Santa Lucia with their research budget. Um, anyone from the Netherlands at all? No? Okay. Well, Netherlands, Scandinavians, Denmark, uh, Switzerland, all do incredibly well on a per capita index, um, which I think is probably fairer than, than most others I can think of. Um, and another, I guess, story would be, let's see, let's do Economics prizes. So, is that a post war neo libertarian consensus? I see. Possibly. Um, so, those are stories trapped in the data. You can find them yourself. I would direct you to them if I did this. Uh, uh, this, you, yeah, as I said, the, the idea is to learn how to build this. But uh, the main thing is to allow people to find their own stories and balance that a bit. You don't want to leave them completely in the dark. Um, but. Uh, Let's just have a very quick look before I finish with 
This is what I started with, as you can see, slightly less easy to find stories about individuals, um, but that's the original, that's converted. Um, this is all the HTML that uses. Uh, those are tags, they're essentially a backbone of that you will flesh out programmatically using D3 in this case. But as you can see, it's not a lot. Um, there are more, far more sophisticated visualizations, but that's multi-element and they're all interactive and various other things. This is not too onerous, I think, in terms of your web dev. That's pretty much the whole file, give or take. Um, the rest is just importing scripts. As you, uh, JavaScript definitely does, has not fixed importation. ECMAScript 6, which is pretty much out now, is, it has made big strides there. JavaScript is moving uh, quite fast. It is improving. Um, some of us think it's going backwards in terms of class, but uh, that's another issue. Um, but yeah, as you can see, I'm loading my, those are my script files, each one that controls a component. Um, and you've got to get the order right, but then I never get to that anyway in programming, right? I mean, a kind of circular imports is always a bit of a problem. And that's loading your D3, which you can load off the web using CDNs, which is pretty efficient. And, um, uh, and to summarize, so mediated by Python, uh, by Jason, Python and JavaScript are a great complement, I really think. They work very well together. Also, something's got to work with, with JavaScript, and it should be Python, right? Um, because the alternative is no one works with JavaScript, and it just goes and does it on its own, and there's probably enough energy and money and everything for JavaScript to roll a data processing library. Um, it'll take a while to, to reach Python's heights, but um, I think the thing is make friends with the elephant. I should have said, make friends with the elephant. Very little web dev needed, as I hope I showed. Uh, these are exciting times. This is a very exciting time for data viz. It's, and data is everything, right? Data is, and visualizing data is communicating data, so because doing it any other way is usually pretty bad. So this is, um, this is a, an exciting time. And a guy called Minard, who did the famous visualization, I should have had a shot here, of Napoleon's army, um, uh, the death march to Moscow. Uh, this was an amazing visualization that captured multi-dimensional data in a single frame. And um, the big challenge, I think, now is capturing multidimensional data. And that's what we need to do. And that's, uh, we now have the tools to hand. So there will be tweets. Um, uh, I, I'll be tweeting around the book and stuff. And, and uh, there's a mailing list if you want to kind of hear things about it. I'm done. I, we got one question. Um, yeah, hi. Brilliant talk. Um, it's, um, I've been, uh, I, I started learning Python and trying to do my own little das data viz project. Um, that was my, the first thing I, I did to learn Python. So basically, I, I'm trying to do exactly what you're doing. Um, so my question is really practical. I mean, have you finished your book? Um, uh, can, it, it's, have it's, you got something on GitHub I can look uh, at? It's, it's, on a, it's a few months away. To, from, I'm in the middle. Can of I talk to you after the Insane period, absolutely. But yeah, I, I, yeah, the book's probably three months away. Um, my editors are on my case. Deadline's whizzing past my ears. So, um, but it's mostly done. It's in, it will be in the kind of the... I'm about to receive feedback, at which point I'll probably just scuffle into a hole and die, but then I finish the book. Anyway, thanks. Uh, do you have a sort of a favorite set of GIS libraries that you work with? When G -G uh, ma mapping libraries, uh, geospatial. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, I use, uh, my brain's gone blank, it's crazy. I do work with shapefiles, it's G -G GDIS, is it? I'm, there's a fairly decent open source, um, it's GDS. I can't remember his name right now, but I use it. Uh, but generally you can find, I don't do a huge amount of mapping work, you can normally find topojson is, is the kind of the format that D3 uses. You can normally find, you'll map the map you need to start with. But yeah, uh, there's a very, I can tell you later on post. Uh, thanks for the nice topic. Uh, just a quick question. Do you recommend any way or method we can use to export the, uh, the report uh, to PDF or, s or something like that. So export which sorry. export the charts uh, or the results into a PDF uh, format or something like that. Um, well, I mean that would be obviously that would be static. So I, I don't think you can do interactive charts in PDFs. Um, but yeah, you can do HTML to PDF. That's pretty trivial, I think.
Uh, yeah, one question. You spoke about Eve and MongoDB. I think it's a very good choice. Uh, have you considered also using Mongo Engine, which is provides um, some more natural way to query Mongo from Python? And there is also an extension, Eve Mongo Engine, which has started. Maybe you could consider. Yeah, I've, using seen, that. I've seen Mongo Engine. Uh, there's so much good stuff to talk about, but especially in that area. But yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I know of Mongo Engine, and um, I'd recommend it. And also for the GIS stuff, just as a complement, Leaflet is excellent for JavaScript. Sorry? Leaflet. Leaflet, yes. Just yeah, I cover leaflet in the book. There's one, there's one example. Uh, leaflet's a great way to do mapping without mm -hmm. having to create everything yourself with D3. And uh, yeah, it should be said, there are some very nice high-level JS libraries. Any more questions? So thanks.